This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. Welcome to the Wealth Ability Show for CPAs, where we're always discovering how to build better clients, a better practice, and a better life. Hi, this is Tom Wheelwright, your host, founder, and CEO of the Wealth Ability Network. So taxes have become a lightning rod um, in our uh, divided society. I mean, we're very divided, very clearly divided. We have this lightning rod now, uh, taxes on the rich, um, you know, and shifting income to the poor and uh, that, you know, the rich are bad and, and this whole divisiveness and it's our clients, right, that are, on, that, are, that are being targeted here. And the question is, so what do we do about that? Do we, do we just kind of shrink into our little hole and become ultra conservative? Or do we actually break out and see this as an opportunity? And I'm very privileged, um, we're very privileged to have on our show today, Francesca Gino, who is a, a professor uh, uh, specializing in this at Harvard um, Business School. And uh, Gina and Francesca, it's just a delight to have you on our show today. Thank you so much, Tom. It is a pleasure to be here. So if you would, just give us a little bit about your background and how you got into this whole idea of, of your book, um, Rebel Talent. Absolutely. So I am during the day a professor at Harvard Business School, and I am a curious scholar who spends a lot of time in organizations talking to leaders, talking to employees, and try to understand what's top of mind for them. And so earlier in my career, I was observing the world, and this is uh, late 90s, where a lot of what you were hearing from leaders in organizations is how to make sure that people stop breaking rules in ways that are destructive. And so this is the time of Enron and other corporate scandals. And I got focused into trying to understand how is it that people break rules in a way that is bad for them, bad for their organizations, and how is it that we could prevent it? But as I was doing the research, I noticed that often rule breaking was positive, that the results were, in fact, innovative ideas, a positive change. And I got really intrigued by the very people who seemed to do that naturally. What was so special about them and what it is that I could learn from them? And so I traveled the world trying to study spend time with these people in different organizations and then doing research on what I thought were the characteristics that define them. I love that. Um, so we have a, a, a very interesting situation going on in our industry is that we have not, we have politicians and we also have the Internal Revenue Service that are really, um, the, internal, the, the politicians are attacking the rich the Internal Revenue Service is attacking the accounting profession. So basically what's going on is the Internal Revenue Service is bullying accountants because they see, I think this, the IRS looks at the accounts as the weak link, mm. frankly. We're the weak link because we're conservative, we're cautious, we're fearful. And so we're, we're the weak link, so let's bully us. I'll, I'll give you an example. So earlier this year, you know, the IRS has this dirty dozen you probably heard of it. And the dirty dozen are those things that they're really, you know, they're going after. Well, one of the dirty dozen they added is this multi pension plan. Well, it's a completely legitimate strategy. I mean, there's, there's, there's nothing in the law that would prevent this. And they can always change the law. And yet they put on their dirty dozen. And I believe they did that because once it's on the dirty dozen, the accountants go, wait a minute, not me. I'm out. I don't want to be part of this. And then on top of that, in this new bill, we have a proposal in Washington, we have $80 billion going to the IRS to enhance audits, technology and audits, not service, technology and audits, which almost doubles their, um, their budget. And so naturally CPAs, you know, and CPAs tend to be afraid of the IRS. So the question is, how do you use that? Because what I see in your book, uh, Rebel Talent, and your whole idea of is this, is this something we should be afraid of? Is this something we should be cautious about? Or is this something that maybe there's an opportunity here? 
I am of the belief that change only happens when we look at a situation that might look negative or something that we certainly didn't want it to happen. And we try to think about the opportunity. Let me share a story that really impacted me and it's out of context, but hopefully the principle is gonna apply here as well. And it's a story of an Italian chef he became quite famous across the globe because he opened a restaurant that reinvented traditional Italian dishes. And the restaurant became the best restaurant in the world in 2016. By the way, imagine the tradition bound Italians, how they felt about his attempt to do something different. They were very afraid being attached to their usual way of cooking. But this chef clearly looks at every situation as an opportunity. And on a very busy night at the restaurant, one of the sous chef ended up dropping a tart to the floor. And I had a broken plate, a broken lemon tart. And he came into the kitchen, saw the tart on the floor, and rather than focusing on all the things that were wrong with it, he came up with an idea and he said to his sous chef, I think we can create a new dessert. And sure enough, they created a new dessert that is now the most popular dessert at the restaurant. And it's called the Oops, I Dropped the Lemon Tart. And it's just a beautiful story to me of a person who no matter what is in front of his eyes, he thinks about where's the opportunity. Maybe the change that you just talked about is something that we're fearful of. Again, something that we wouldn't have chosen ourselves, but where's the opportunity? If I think about the last year and a half, almost two years of many leaders and employees finding themselves having to, do with the, to deal with the crisis, nobody wanted COVID to happen. But the people who fared better in terms of how engaged they are in their job, how they were thriving despite the pandemic, are people who have this approach, this tendency to look at the crisis and seeing where's the opportunity? What it is that I could be doing differently? Where is it that I see learning happening in a way that is helpful to my work? And so I wonder whether there is an opportunity here also not to be fearful but to try to think about where's the opportunity in this particular situation that we seem so, to be so negative about. And, and, and here's what I see. I, I actually look at a couple of different aspects here. One is, okay, if the rest of the industry is afraid, boy, that makes it easy to not be afraid and, and to attack it head on. I've always said, if, <laughs> I always tell people, if your CPA is afraid of the, IR, is afraid of the IRS, you need a new CPA because <laughs> the IRS doesn't hire the best and the brightest. I'm sorry, they don't. I'm gonna write that down. It seems like something <laughs> to very much keep in mind. There you go. Um, you know, the CPAs should know more about tax than the IRS does, frankly. Um, and that, that's really our job is to, we're supposed to be the um, NBA of, uh, of, of tax professionals. But let me ask you this question. So. It's fine for the leader, you know, to have that mindset. I mean, that's my natural. I'm very curious. I know you actually happen to know my brother. So, you know, he's very curious. And, and that all comes from, my, from our mother, who, who was the most curious person I've ever met. And, but what do you do for employees? Because to me, the challenge is, yeah, I'm going to be curious. This, this, this is who I am. I was born curious. Is it a matter of finding employees or can you actually engage um, curiosity and the idea and the vision of opportunity within your staff and your employees? What I find fascinating is that as leaders, we have a great opportunity to be contagious in our curiosity. So the fact that we model the behavior for others, we are the first one to ask why questions or what if or how could we incredibly helpful. And so part of what we can do to encourage others to be curious is to ask these type of questions. But we can also use other methods. A couple of ideas that are, I think, very easy to implement. One is that most people, 
no matter what job they have, have performance goals for them. Something that mm -hmm. by the end of the year or in six months, they want to be sure to achieve. If we were also to add learning goals, mm -hmm. then not only people stay curious, but actually they perform better. Great research suggests that that is the case. So that to me seems like very easy, cheap to add, uh, not so drastic of a change. And then the second idea is to find moments and the regularity of it might change uh, depending on the context specifically, but to really trigger on people's mind this why question. So for example, I work with a large Canadian bank and the bank came to my colleague and myself asking the questions, what it is that we could be doing to raise curiosity in our organization. And so we work with them sending emails twice a week where the ask was super simple. Think about why and what if more often during your day at work versus a neutral email or nothing. And after three weeks, we looked at the implication of those emails, super simple. And what we found is that the people who received the emails that asked them to think about why and what if, not only felt more curious, but you actually see their curiosity in their behavior. So they reach across the functions and across silos more often. They felt more supported by their colleagues, that networks that were more diverse, so whenever they needed information or help, their colleagues were there to help them. They performed at higher levels. They felt more satisfied with the work that they had. And so it feels like even the simple idea of finding moments to ask why and what if, so that is top of mind, it could be quite helpful to you, all of us. Oh, well, you know, I love that, the, the why and what if, because, so, for example, we'll get a client that will come to us and, and you know, they'll look at this. Okay, I've got this mug. Is, is this mug deductible? Right. And what I encourage our, we have uh, CPA members all over the, the country. Um, what I encourage them to do is, that's, the, that's not the better question. The better question is, how do I make this mug deductible? Right. So why would right? Why would this mug be deductible? And what if I change certain things about this mug to make it deductible, like how I use this mug, right? If I use this mug in my business, so really simple, if I use this mug in my business, it's deductible. If I use it in my house, it's not deductible. So that's a very simple, that's what you're talking about, right? That's the why and the what if. Yep. He's changing uh, the question to one that is broader and that really allows you to bring more information into the conversation so that you understand the issue at hand uh, more deeply. I, I like that. So let me ask you another question. One of the challenges that we have as CPAs in, in my profession, in our profession, is that um, we like to be right, okay? <laughs> who doesn't who really, doesn't really we yeah but we love it in fact we love it so much we're scared to death of being wrong which is why i think cpas tend to be afraid of the irs auditing their clients i don't care if the irs audits my clients i'm going to bill the client for that um i you know i'm going to help the client protect themselves and i i certainly don't want the client the irs to win that audit but mm -hmm. so what if the irs audits my client but I think so, so much of the time, we're just afraid of, could we be wrong? Could we have made a mistake? Could, you know, is, is there something that, that we're missing here? And so what my question is, how do you deal with mistakes in the workforce? Because I actually have come to believe that the most important part of learning is making mistakes. So how do you help people feel comfortable as you, as you say, making a positive mistake. Mm -hmm. So our reactions matter quite a bit. Part of the reason why I love the story of the broken lemon tart is because of the reaction of the leader who was there. Because the most common one would have been to yell at the mistake right. or to use the moment to talk about the importance of high standards. And he didn't. He focused on the question of what it is that we're learning in this moment. And as it turns out, I'm very much in agreement with you 
Learning only happens if we're making mistakes. They're just a part of the journey. And so talking about them more open, openly and really focused on what it is that we've learned from that moment, I think is a practice that really is gonna change the narrative around mistakes. It's also to me important to have as a habit of mind, the one of asking questions about what it is that we're learning, no matter how much expertise and experience we have under our belt. I ended up a few years ago studying quite carefully what happened to Captain Sally Salenberger, who was the captain on a flight in 2009, where the plane was left with no thrust in the engines, and he ended up in 208 seconds deciding to ditch the plane in the Hudson River. Right. Fascinating story for many different reasons. What an ingenious solution, especially knowing that he was clearly an expert at his craft. Over 30,000 hour, uh, hours of, of flying experience, served in the military, all sorts of sources of experience and knowledge. But he had created a habit for himself such that every time he walked into the plane, he would ask, what do I stand to learn today? And so is this ability of not focusing on what we know, but what is left to learn. I think that when we make that shift, then we understand that there is more for us to learn. Mistakes are part of the journey and we embrace them differently, whether it's us making mistake or uh, seeing others and reacting to their, to their mistakes. By the way, the surprising aspect of that story that I think a lot of people don't know is that in those 208 seconds, here you have a person who consider all sorts of options. So speak of curiosity, kept considering alternatives despite the fact that he had no time. So I think quite remarkable for that and what that habit of mind can do for us. No, I, I, I think that's, um, I love that. We actually have one of our values in our company is break it. So, and employees have a tough time with that one, right? Because there's, we're, we're programmed all through school to get the right answer. We're not, at least in, 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 in American schools, we're not rewarded for how we come up with the answer. We're rewarded for coming up with the answer. I, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a simple example. So many, many, many years ago when I was in college. Um, I, I, I had this professor, it was his first time as a professor. He'd been in, in the profession for years and years, actually very high up in one of the big uh, accounting firms. And um, he, he gave his final exam and I get my final, and I, I knew this stuff, I knew it cold. Um, so I'm going, I'm expecting an, a, a good grade out of this, I get my exam back and lo and behold, I've got a C on this exam instead of an A. And I'm going, why, why did this happen? So I went to talk to him. I said, I just need to understand why, right? I'm not gonna just let it go. I need to understand why. And uh, he, he goes through, he says, well, my grader, I told him that you, you, know, you have to follow this process and that that's how you get the points. And I, I said, so let me show you how I did it. And let me ask you, would this be an alternative way to do it? And we go through it and he goes, oh yeah, you could do it that way. And he changed my grade. <laughs> and I was going, well, this is, you know, we get into this process idea. I, I you know, one more story. So my, my wife is also an accountant. She has her own uh, CPA firm. Uh, very exciting discussions, by the way, as you can imagine. I we can only about, imagine. We talk about taxes, morning, noon, noon and night. It is so much fun. So, so she's, she, she's told, told me, and I've actually put her on stage to say this. She's told me she will not take a doctor as a client. I said, why not? She goes, they already know everything. They don't need me. And one of the things that we've made a decision on in our CPA practice is that we only take clients who want to learn. And so here's a question I've got for you is how how much does the people you surround yourself with, how much impact does that have on the curiosity and looking for opportunities? Wonderful question. Our relationships matter a ton. 
one of the things that is true about curiosity as well as more broadly the thirst for learning is that it passes on to others. It's very contagious. We see it in our data when we do research, whether it's the organization or the controlled environment of a lab, we see that curiosity is contagious. So you definitely want to surround yourself with people who are as interested as you are in learning and also people who take mistakes for what they are. There are just opportunities for that learning to happen. One of the companies that I spent some time studying is Microsoft. And I studied the company at the time where they were transitioning to this culture of uh, moving from knowing it all from, to learning it all. And they adopted the idea of the growth mindset, which basically means that you have the belief that your intelligence and capabilities can always grow rather than be something that is fixed once you're born. And what is interesting is that if you walk around the company or you ask leaders for examples or even employees, for example, they have clear moments where somebody on their team, after a mistakes or a situations of crisis, came to them and said, look, I want to help you out because we're under pressure. We need to solve the problem. But once the storm has passed, let's sit down and figure out what it is that we're learning. That's not common practice, but to the extent that we can do that, again, for ourselves, but also the people we surround ourselves with, the more curiosity we're going to see in all sorts of practices and organizations. Okay, so going to that uh, point, um, Francesca, um, how important is it not to correct other people's mistakes, but actually have them correct their own mistakes? In other words, give them feedback okay, here's, you know, and ask the question rather than give the answer. So for example, mm -hmm. um, we have to review our tax returns, right? We have a prepare, then we have a reviewer. We actually have two different levels of review. And I'll get, I'll look at something, I'm going, oh no, no, this doesn't work this way. And so my inclination is just, you know, it's easy to just say, well, I'll just fix it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what I prefer to do is I'm gonna, cause I'm insatiable with curiosity is, Okay, so how, what would you do differently here? How could you change this? What, what do you think we should be doing? And actually force them to go back and do it. I will tell you, when you're coming up against a deadline, it's really hard to do that um, because you just have this natural tendency, I'll just fix it. But can you just address the importance of letting people not just make their own mistakes, but actually correct their own mistakes? To me, what you're doing dealing the way you're dealing with mistakes is just beautiful because you are giving the person the chance to learn and fix it on their own in a way that changes their experience such that next time they're completing a task or filling out a form, they're going to be extra careful. And also when they see others engaging mistakes that are going to be more likely to help them work through the mistakes and the learning rather than fixing it themselves. And so I think that your practice is just beautiful. And I hope that even when you feel the pressure, you're going to think about the evidence and the data that backs you up and continue taking that stand. Yeah, I will admit that on October 15th, which is our final filing due date for tax returns, I am literally pushing it back to the person who um, made the mistake and saying, okay, well, tell me what tell me what we're gonna do here because this needs to be corrected. So, you know, let's let's make sure this gets done. It's just so tempting to do it yourself. Um, but here's what I, I found in our organization is that we find that people grow faster in our organization than they did in their previous organization. So let's say we hire somebody with three years of experience from another CPA firm, what we tend to find is that within a year, they've, they've tripled their learning. Um, and I think, I think that's why. I, I honestly think it's because we not only let them make a mistake, but we actually force them to correct their mistake. I always tell people, um, it's okay to come to me with a problem as long as you always also come to me with the solution but please do not bring me a problem you don't have a solution to. I may not agree with the solution, I may add to the solution, but I want you to come with the solution because the job of an advisor 
is to solve a problem. <laughs> and if we don't know how to solve a problem, frankly, why are we advisors? Yep. And Tom, what you're also doing when you give that opportunity to people is letting them know that you trust mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to fix the problem. And so, again, I think you're changing the psychological experience in the moment in a way that helps their growth. Wonderful. Yeah. So I have this belief that CPAs are way underutilized. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of smart people that are doing things that are just wrote like tax returns and financial statements and bookkeeping. And I'm going to me. So I look at this next opportunity. What's, what's the next big fear is technology in our profession, right? It's we're going to have blockchain technology and we're no longer have to do audits. We're going to have artificial intelligence. We're not no longer have to do tax returns. The, the software will do the tax returns. So, you know, when, when you look at that, how do you get people over that fear of, uh, change, basically, because that's what it is, right? It's a fear of change. And I see the opportunity, I'm going, oh, that means I don't have to do that, which I never liked doing in the first place, but some people like doing it. So how do you get them to that next level to say, okay, look, yes, we understand that this job is going away, but look how much fun this new job is going to be. How do you, how do you get people there? So the reframing on the opportunity is super important. It's very natural. We are all human beings. At the moment of change, when we think about is the loss, what it is that we're going to be losing by right. moving to something different. And obviously that experience of a loss is a negative one. And so to the extent that you can reframe their attentions onto the opportunity, what do you think is going to be different and better gets people more excited uh, for the change. I like it. So um, again, the, the book is Rebel Talent, right? And I, I like, I actually like the, the subtitle as at least as much as the title. And the subtitle is Why It Pays to Break the Rules at Work and in Life. And I love that. I love the emphasis on uh, forever learning. I had my favorite professor in graduate school said, the great thing about taxes is the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, final words and final thoughts of specific things that people can do to not just encourage this at work, but get through it yourself and, and make your own changes so that you're seeing opportunities. I hope, and this sounds very self-serving, but I hope that people are going to read the book or at least look for summaries uh, from the book. Since I think given what you told me and what I've learned in this conversation, there are some really helpful ideas for embracing the new with a little bit more boldness, uh, but with also less, less fear. I love it, I love it. So it's Francesca Gino. Um, where could we find more about you, Francesca? I have a website called francescagino.com, but on the book specifically, uh, one activity that might be fun only takes six minutes, there is a rebel test. And so if those listening are going to uh, www.rebeltalents.org, they're going to find the rebel test. And if you end up being a pirate, it's a very good thing. I love it. I love it, love it, love it. Thank you. Just remember everyone that when we're looking for opportunities instead of being afraid of what loss might happen, what we always end up with is better clients, a better practice, and a better life. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com. Thank you.